go borrow vessels go borrow vessels i did something like this message some about 10 years ago but um, i've reworked it and i think it's appropriate for the season we are in go borrow vessels it is part of the process by which you are going to enter into discovery in this year and i want you to turn with me in your bibles to second kings chapter 4 second kings chapter 4 and we're going to read from verses 1 to 7 second kings chapter 4 from verses 1 to 7 second kings chapter 4 verse 1 to 7 are you there all right and let's hear the reading of god's word a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to elijah saying your servant my husband is dead and you know that your servant feared the lord and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves so elijah said to her what shall i do for you tell me what do you have in the house and she said your maid servant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil then he said go borrow vessels from everywhere from all your neighbors empty vessels do not gather just a few and when you have come in you shall shut the door behind you and your sons then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones so she went from him shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out and it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son bring me another vessel and he said to her there is not another vessel so the oil ceased then she came and told the man of god and he said go sell the oil pay your debt you and your sons live on the rest as you can tell the message my sermon title is from the verse 3 go borrow vessels this woman came to the prophet elisha and she had a dilemma she was in a situation and i believe that at various points in our lives we can identify with this woman because her problems were complex and complicated she had five different kinds of problems first she was suffering personal pain because she was a widow she had just lost her husband we are not told how long ago since her husband died she probably lost her husband uh, a week before or a month before but it seems as if it's not too long ago since her husband died and she is grieving she's mourning she's crying because she has suffered a tragedy the breadwinner of her home is gone her lover is gone her friend is gone and she's crying so she is going through her own personal pain but one thing you have to realize in life is that when you go through problems problems don't take a leave most of the time when problems are coming they don't come alone they invite their cousins along and so whilst you are mourning and you expect people to have sympathy on you unfortunately the problems pile up so she had a second problem it was a financial crisis this financial crisis was because she owed money it seemed as if they owed money when the husband was alive they couldn't settle the debt she the debt they owed until their husband passed away now if you know anything about the world in which this woman lived in those days the man was the ultimate bread winner he was the one who brought in the money now he's dead the question is if you couldn't pay your debt when the breadwinner was alive how can you settle it now that he's gone so she has a financial crisis and as if that was not enough she had a domestic nightmare 
What is this domestic nightmare? She's about to lose her children. The creditor is coming to take her children away from her. Can you imagine? She's already lost her husband. She's broke. And her children are going to be taken away from her. She's been reduced to nothing in life. So she has this domestic problem. And she's thinking, what is going to happen when these two boys are taken away from me? That's all I have. And quite apart from that, she was suffering a social stigma. Shame in the community. If you know anything about debt, when you owe money, you are not the most honorable person alive. You yourself feel bad. And people sometimes speak things about you that make you feel bad. Owing money is not funny. If you've owed money before, you know it's not funny. Even if you come to church and you owe somebody in the church, you, can, you know how you feel. You, you, are, you are going to sit on a row and you see the person you owe on the, on the other extreme of the, of the row. And, and you get there and, and for some reason the Holy Spirit leads you to another row. You know, you, you, you see people and you dodge, you hide because you can't stand them. And, and it's a stigma, it's a social stigma, it's a sense of inferiority. Fifth, she had spiritual disappointment and that was the most difficult problem she had. She was frustrated with God because her husband served God for so long. The husband was a prophet, worked under Elisha. God used him. And now it seems as if after this man has worked for God for so long, God is abandoning the man and the, fa and the family. And not only is God abandoning her, but she also believes that the church has also abandoned her. So she has a spiritual disappointment. She is disappointed. There is a social stigma. She has this domestic situation where her children are going to be taken away. She has a financial problem and she's crying as a widow. How many problems can one woman carry? But there she is. And she goes to the only place where she thinks she can receive some help. This is her last stop. She goes to her husband's boss. The man who used to employ the husband, the prophet Elisha. In those days they had a school of prophets and the prophets worked under Elisha. And so she goes to the boss, who is a man of God, but also the boss of the husband. And says... You have to do something. And she narrates her problems to Elisha. Elisha is a prophet. And normally when you are a prophet or you have spiritual power, when people come to you with a problem, most of the time you dispense solutions. You either say, let me pray for you. Or, and lay hands on them. Or maybe you dip your hand in your pocket and bring out some money and give to them. These were the obvious responses everybody expected from Elisha. Either Elisha puts his hand in his pocket and says, okay, take this. Or Elisha says, let me pray for you. It will be all right. But he didn't pray and he didn't give her money. Elisha responded in the most unusual way. She responded to the woman's misery with questions. Have you ever been in a situation where you have problems and you want somebody to help you and the person asks you questions? And you're wondering, I mean, listen to me. I'm suffering here and you're asking me questions. If I knew the answer, do you think I'll be standing here? That's what you would say. So Elisha questions the woman. And Elisha asks two questions, two interesting questions. I want you to note the question. The first one, Elisha says, what shall I do for you? In other words, what do you want me to do for you? What do you think I can do for you? What do you want me to do for you? What are you asking me to do? This question was focused on what the prophet could do, the prophet's responsibility, what Elisha could do. Then he asks a second question. What do you have in the house? This had nothing to do with Elisha. It had to do with a woman. What shall I do for you? What do you have in the house? Two questions.
One focus on Elisha's responsibility. The other focus on the woman's responsibility. Now let me ask you the same, a similar question. Granting you come to me and you are in a situation like this woman and you can't come to my office, you book an appointment with my office and finally you are sitting before Pastor Otebel in his office. And you cry and say, Pastor, listen to me, I have these problems and I owe money and the creditor is coming and I'm being ejected and my children and all this. And you tell me this very, very, very moving tale of woes from your end. Then I ask you two questions. What shall I do for you and what do you have in your house? Which of those questions would you answer? Which one? The first one. That, that's the natural thing. What shall I do for you? Pastor, give me money. Or pray for me. Or talk to somebody for me. Or, or help me, give me some capital. You, 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 I can guarantee you that you will answer the first question. I, I believe even me. I will answer the first question. Because that is the logical question to ask. Because you went to the man expecting him to help you. Now he says, what shall I do for you? You will say, give me this. But note, the woman did not answer the first question. She didn't. What shall I do for you? What do you have? She didn't answer the first question. The obvious question was not answered. And that is very important. Because in life, the questions you choose to respond to will determine the answers you receive. You're going to have a lot of questions, but the questions you choose to respond to will determine the answers you receive. The questions you choose to respond to will determine the quality of answers you receive. Many times when we are in a crisis, we choose to answer the easy questions. And you say, Pastor, what is the easy question? The easy question is the question that requires somebody else to do something for you. That's the easy one. What shall I do for you? Oh, give me money. What shall I do for you? Do this for me. What do you have? We don't respond to that one. But that is the question the woman chose to respond to. Not what shall I do for you, but what do you have in your house? Because when she chose that question, she was saying to Elisha, I don't want you to give me the leftover solutions you have. I want to have a solution that I can sustain in my life. Do you know that if you go to somebody and you ask the person to help you, granting you need money, and you ask the person to give you money, and the person gives you money, in all honesty, do you think it is the best that the person gave you? No. No. Because the person too has his responsibility. He has his wife, he has his children. So he has to take care of his wife, take care of his children, take care of his rent, take care of his responsibilities. And what is left over is what you get. The question is, do you want the leftover or you want your own money? Do you want to be given fish or you want to be taught how to fish for yourself? This woman says, I don't want your fish. Just teach me how to fish for myself. That is the question she responded to. And what was her answer? She began to respond and she said this. Listen to what she said. She says, I have nothing but. I have nothing but she had a realization. All of a sudden she realized, yes, my husband is gone. Yes, he didn't leave any money behind. 
my children are going to go. Then as she was thinking about all that she didn't have, she started constructing a sentence and she said, I have nothing but. Everybody say, I have nothing but. Anytime you introduce a but in a phrase, you are negating the first phrase. So you say, I have nothing but. It means what you're going to say next will negate what you just said. It's like somebody looks at you and says, you know, I like the way you dress and, and oh, you are so handsome and I like your, your, bra, your blouse and, and your, your, is it uh, skirt? Your skirt and, and all of that, but the moment they interject but to everything they like, it means they're going to tell you something they don't like, which to them is more important than all the things they like. All right? Now, so when, when you're saying, I have nothing, but it means you're going to talk about what you have. That simply means, although you didn't have something, you have now made a realization. She said, I have nothing but. This year, that is the way I want you to talk. When you are complaining about your problems, and you say, oh, life is hard, and, and things are tough in Ghana, but uh, you know these days you know it's difficult to import things and then the chinese are disturbing our business in ghana but these days you know i couldn't pay my rent but because anytime you introduce but you are pausing to introduce a new concept now somebody will say but what but i don't know but it's a but anyhow I have nothing but I'm thinking about what I have. I have nothing but. Tell your neighbor, I have nothing but. If you are not married, you say, Well, I'm 45, I'm not married, but. We have been married for 10 years, we have no children, but. I just went for the interview and I failed, but. Because until you introduce the but, the negative will control you. But when you say but, you are saying in spite of this, there is another way, there is an alternative. So this woman is thinking, I have lost my husband, I have nothing. I have no money. I have nothing. I may even lose my children. I have nothing. My relatives have forgotten me since my husband died. I have nothing. But then she remembered, I have something. She remembered, I have something. She says, but a jar of oil. She had something. She had nothing, but she had something. You have nothing, but you have something. She had something. Now, why is it important for her to discover what she had? Because this jar of oil that she had, it was not a big drum of oil for, you, for, for it to be important for somebody to remember. It's like somebody says, my rent, I can't pay my rent. My children's fees, we have no money. My husband is dead. And I have all these problems. And now they want to eject us from the house. And now we're, we're, we're losing everything. But... I have a bottle of Zomi. Can, can, you, can you imagine that? I mean, this is what she's saying. I have all these problems, but I have a bottle of Zomi. Now, now somebody's going to say, hey, what has Zomi got to do with their problem? Are you trying to tell me you can solve all these problems with your Zomi bottle? Yes! I have nothing but I have this bottle of oil. It may be small, it is domestic, 
But it can be the beginning of the process of change in my life. Anybody could have overlooked the jar of oil because it wasn't a barrel of oil. It was just a jar of oil. It was for domestic consumption. You remember the, the, the other widow that Elisha met previously? Right? And Elisha said, go, go and give me something. Give me something. And she says, hey, man of God, I have nothing except a little flour and some piece of some oil. And I'm going to make a cake and we will eat and die. That is the same kind of oil this woman had. A jar of oil. It is not for mass consumption. But she says, I have it. It was not big. It was not huge. But she still remembered she had it. She remembered she had it. She had something. And what she had, had some value. It was valuable. It didn't have a lot of value. It may not be the most expensive thing she had, but she had it. She had, and it had value. And the good thing was that it was not in somebody's house. It was in her house. It was readily available. That's what Elijah had asked. What do you have in your house? It isn't what do other people have that you can go and borrow. He says, what do you have? You start with what you have. And she says, I have this jar of oil and it's available it's in my house and it can be used it can be used so the widow realized that although she had nothing she had something and what she had was valuable it wasn't the most valuable commodity but it had a certain price tag on it it was readily available and it could be used and with that, the miracle of change and transformation began in her life. God began to turn around her life and turn around the situation. Do you know, it doesn't take much for God to turn around your situation. So God starts a turn around process. And what are the three ingredients, or there are three ingredients in God's turnaround process? And I'll just run through them quickly in summary form, and then I will go into detail with each one of them. The first step in God's turnaround process is the release of the creative word. The creative word. That is God's input. That is what God brings to the equation. The creative word. His word. The second is the jar of oil. That is your input. So God brings something to the table. You bring something to the table. And the third is borrowed vessels. That is what other people bring to the table. So for God to turn around your situation, there is a God part, there is your part, and there is other people's part. And you have to learn to mix all these things in proper proportion. God's part is not your part. Your part is not other people's part. You have to know that other people cannot be God. And God cannot be other people. And you cannot be God and you cannot be other people too. So God's part, that is the word. And that's what Elisha was going to release. The prophetic word. Then... What the woman had, her jar of oil, it's not much, it's a little bottle, but she had it. Then, what other people had, empty vessels. It is when these three things come together that God starts the process of transformation in our lives. And I believe that what God did for this woman, he can do for us. There is a part he plays. There is a part we play. And there is a part other people must play. What I have seen is most times we want other people to play the role of God. Or we want God to play our role. And God says, no, I have my role. Other people have their role. And you have your role. So each of these components must be brought together. And when you mix it right, you will have 
the results you're looking for. God's part, your part, other people's part. Anytime you're in a crisis, remember there is a God part, there is your part, and there is other people's part. There is always these three will be present. God's part, your part, other people's part. You can't solve all the problem by yourself. You need people. But you can't need people to play your role. You need people to play their role. And you play your role. And God plays his role. And the three components produces the miracle. And that's what Elisha was teaching this woman to do. He's teaching her financial independence. Not financial dependence. Elisha didn't, this woman, didn't want this woman to go with money and then come next week for more money and come next month for more money. Anytime she has a need, she comes to Elisha. I know there are some of us Ghanaians who feel bossy and powerful when people come to us daily for help. But the best help you can give to somebody is to make the person financially or morally, or not morally, morally but emotionally independent from you. So the person doesn't have to always be with you to solve their problem. Whether you are counseling somebody or not. I mean, as a pastor, I don't want people to come to me every time and weep the same thing. I say, okay, come, let me pray for you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And I cast out a rare spirit of sorrow from you in Jesus' name. They say, oh, pastor, I'm feeling so good today. She goes, next two weeks, she comes. Bring your head. In the name of Jesus, I cast out the spirit of sorrow. Go in Jesus' name. Behold. Say, oh, pastor, you've made my day. I'm so happy. Then next two weeks, she comes. That's not what, no, I, I don't want that. I want to be able to take that person, teach the person how to deal with the situation so when the person goes and the situation comes up, they have the tools to solve the problem. So Elisha is saying, it's not what I can do for you, it's what you have. That is what we are going to work on. We are starting with what you have. So let's take the three components together. The first is the creative word. What is the creative word? The creative word is divine wisdom and direction. It's a word of direction. It's a word of wisdom that comes from God. When I stand here and preach, most of the time, that's what I'm doing. I'm giving you the creative word. I'm giving you the word from God. God's word. That by itself cannot do everything for you but it's it's an essential component for what you want to achieve so i give you god's word it's word of wisdom or a word of direction when when i stand at the beginning of the year and i declare this is a year of discovery i've given you a creative word that word cannot by itself solve all your problems. It is one com component that has been put on the table. You also must bring your oil and put it there and then we must bring other people's component and we must mix them together and then we will get the results. But most of the time, the moment people hear God's component, they think the problem is solved. No. God has spoken the word but you must also do something about it. So there's God's component, it's a creative word, it's a word of direction, it may be a prophecy, it may be a vision, it may be a word from preaching, it may be a scriptural verse, it may be a declaration at the new year. All of that is component number one, the creative word. It's divine wisdom and direction. It originates from God. It doesn't come from man. It is God's component. And because it originates from God, it carries the power of God. It carries God's power. Every word that originates from God carries God's power. And interestingly, and this is very important, it imparts faith into you. Do you know how you feel when you hear a creative word from God? You have, you develop what is called a can-do spirit. At the Independence Square, when we enter the new year and I said, this is your year of discovery. And I began to prophesy. All of a sudden you felt, whoa, things are going to happen. That is step number one. 
And it's crucial because you need that faith. If you don't have faith, you won't even take your jar of oil. You despise your jar of oil. So you need the creative word. It imparts faith into you. It's what you get when you come to church on Sunday. You come to sit here in church. And you hear a word. And, and all of a sudden you feel like something. You, you say, where is the next lion? It's faith. It's a creative word. It comes from God. It carries God's power. And then it constructs your destiny. The creative word constructs your destiny. It, des it designs how the future is going to look like. It builds a new future for you. It is God's divine input that sets the miracle process on course. So, you come and you say, I need this miracle. I need change. I need a financial breakthrough. I need to be able to solve this problem. It's going to start always with the creative word. If you take the creative word out, nothing can be done. All things were made by the word and without the word is nothing made that is made. In him is life. The word has life. If you want to change something, you have to deal with the word. When God wanted you to change the condition of the earth, he didn't go out physically to try to do anything, but he released the word out of his mouth. Let there be light. It's a creative word. It constructs your destiny. How do you respond to the creative word? You must hear it. You must accept it. And you must act on it. So when the creative word comes, you hear it. And you don't hear it and fight it, but you accept it and then you act on it. You start doing something about what you've heard. That's the creative word. Elisha said to the woman, go borrow vessels. That's the creative word. Now she could have said, what should I do with them? But she obeyed. She acted on the creative word. It's the word of God. The second component you need for a turnaround process is what the woman had. The jar of oil. The jar of oil. Everybody has got his hair or her own jar of oil. It is something that God has put in you. It, the jar of oil represents your inborn gifts, talents, and ideas. Everybody has got inborn gifts, talents, and ideas. It's there. You know it. God, God wired you with it in your DNA when you were being formed in your mother's womb. Everybody in this world has got some inborn gift, talent, idea that, that is unique to them. Is the ajar of oil. That's what you have. That's what you're going to use to fuel your life. That's what you're going to use to flow in life. That's what you're going to do to, to move in life. That's what's going to feed you in life. Your jar of oil. It may not be much. Remember, this woman has huge responsibilities. But she remembered she had a jar of oil. And she was so preposterous. To believe that that little jar of oil could solve her complex problems. Do you know that your complex problems can be solved by little, little, tiny, little things like ideas? It's your jar of oil. Some idea that God puts in your mind. Or some ability you have. It's your jar of oil. That, that's all you have. You have nothing. You may not have parents. You may not have a husband. You may not have a wife. You may not have children. You may not have education. But you always have a jar of oil. There is something you always have. It is inborn. It is God's investment in your life. It is that which God has invested in your life. They make you useful. And you never lose it. You never lose it. 
And I've told this story several times, but let me restate it because when I first watched the video of this, this story, it made such a profound impact on me. And I've told the story before about this young boy and I saw in the video. He was born as a twin, deformed, blind, mentally challenged. You would say mentally handicapped. Deformed physically, mentally handicapped, blind visually. And the reason was because when he was a twin in the mother's womb, for some reason he didn't get the right amount of oxygen and nutrition because the other twin took up all the oxygen and nutrition. And this boy was born less than two pounds. But he survived. But the one who had all the oxygen and, and whatever died. And after the boy was born, he was deformed, blind, mentally handicapped. He is the kind of person that if you saw somewhere, you, you will ask your God, why did God bring such a person to the world? If God is a good God, why is this person born? Because he looks like he's a waste of space, time, energy and everything. Sometimes we see such people and blame God as a cruel God. Because of his condition, he couldn't do much. He didn't go to school, he couldn't learn, didn't do much, just roam about the house. But he had other brothers and sisters. And the uh, parents, obviously, were so, they loved their child so much, they didn't put him in, a, in an institution, they kept the child at home. Everybody says, go and put him somewhere, leave him somewhere. In ancient Africa, they would have said, he was a curse. They had a music teacher who used to come to the house to teach music. And he would come and teach the so-called normal children. The younger one and the older one. Because they had other kids. And they didn't bother to teach this one. He would just be there, you know, doing nothing. One day the music teacher comes and, and tries, is trying hard to teach the younger brother a piece of music. And he's trying and this younger brother is not getting it. And he's playing, playing, playing. This, no, the younger brother is trying but he's not getting it. And the music teacher and, and, and all of them move from where the piano is, go to another part of the house. And this boy who is sitting near, somewhere near the piano begins to feel his way from where he was to where the piano was. He finally found the piano stool, sat on it and started banging on the keys. Just banking, banking, making noise. The parents heard it, but they didn't bother him. They said, let him have fun. It doesn't bother anybody. So he kept banging and banging and banging, bang, 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 just random notes, random notes. And he did it for some minutes. And after some time, after he had started banging, 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 he started playing a melody. And what he was playing was what the teacher was trying to teach his so-called normal brother, which he couldn't get. And he played that melody. And he started playing. And then he started playing all the songs the, the teacher has been teaching. Nice melodies and playing and playing and playing and playing. The family moved from where they were and came to see the spectacle of this so-called useless, quote-unquote, child playing music. And the teacher was so moved that the family was in tears. Mother is in tears. Teacher is in tears. And they come to sit by this boy. And the teacher starts to play another melody. And whatever he played, the boy will play. Whatever he played, the boy will play. Whatever he played, the boy will play. Within a short time, the music lesson has now shifted from the younger brother to him. And he's learning music. And so what they started doing, the, the, the family had lots of records of, you know, classical music, Beethoven, Strauss, Mozart, Handel, and all these great masters. And they would play the record. And whatever he heard, he played it. Whatever he heard, he played it. Pretty soon he had played all the music in the house. They had to give him more music. At the time I was watching this video, not only was he playing music, he was now composing classical music. If you saw this boy, you say he has nothing.
but he had his jar of oil. Because within each one of us, no matter who you are, no matter how low you are, no matter how down you are, there is something in you which you will never lose. You may lose your husband, you may lose your children, you may lose your friends, you may lose your nationality, you may lose whatever, you may lose your hair, you may lose your teeth, but you will never lose your jar of oil. And that's what the woman remembered. She says, I have lost everything. My husband, my money, my dignity. I'm losing my children. But God left me something to work with. I'm just here to tell you, you may have lost whatever you think you've lost, but God has left you something to work with. It is called the jar of oil. That is your part. God will give you the creative word. But you must also come with your part, your jar of oil. It is God's investment in you. It will, you will never lose it. It is your strength and advantage in life. It sets you apart from all others and gives you an edge over others. Your jar of oil. That's your advantage. That's why the woman could remember, I have, I have nothing but some little palm nut oil, some little zomi there, some little corn oil. How do they call it? Canola? Some little canola oil. What do you do with your jar of oil? You must discover it. You must position it. And you must use it. You must use it. Now I want you to notice something about how this is described. It's called the jar of oil. Everybody say jar of oil. There are two parts to this. There is the jar and there is the oil. Did you notice that? It didn't say oil. A jar of oil oil. The jar is the container. Is the container. Is the system. It represents a method. A system. A container. The oil is the creative part. It's your ideas. It's your gift. It's your talent. But remember this jar, this oil is contained in a jar. So Elisha begins a process of change. And Elisha didn't tell the woman to go and borrow oil. He's, the problem with the woman is not the oil, it's, it's the jar. It's the container for what she had. The problem for this young boy I talked about, it's not the gift, it's the container. She, he couldn't get, he, he wasn't able to get his gift out of his container. So when people saw his container, they limited his gift. His container was his body. They saw how blind he was. They saw everything that limited him. They said, he has nothing. So if you are not able to deal with the container of what you have, you may limit your oil. Because where you put your oil is crucial to what you do with the oil. Let me ask you this question. And you must ask yourself, where am I keeping my oil? Where am I keeping my gifts? Where am I keeping my ideas? Is the jar I'm using limiting my oil? Is the system I'm using limiting my ability? So Elisha says, I'm going to do something about your problem, woman. You don't have an oil problem. You have a container problem. The problem is not the oil. The problem is the container. The container is limited. And as a result, your oil is not flowing the way it should flow. 
Now I have to help you to get out of that jar so that there will be a larger flow of the oil in your life. God, most of the time, has no problem with the ideas we have, the gifts he has given to us. He has no problem with that. The problem is how we have packaged what he has given us. So Elisha says to the woman, go borrow vessels. What are borrowed vessels? Borrowed vessels are the systems and lessons from other people. They are not yours. So you remember, there is a God part, the creative word. There is your part, your jar of oil. There is other people's part, their systems and lessons and experiences. You're going to use all of these. And Elisha says, you have the oil, but go and borrow vessels. He didn't say go and borrow oil. Go and borrow vessels. You can't borrow somebody's gift. Can you? You can't borrow my gift. My gift is my gift. You can't borrow my gift. But you can borrow my methods. You can learn from my methods. You can learn from the way I do things. But you can't learn who I am. My gift is my gift. Your gift is your gift. It's your oil. The challenge is not with your oil. It's with your vessels. Elisha is literally saying, telling the woman, you have the solution, but the solution is wrongly packaged. It's in a jar. And a jar is a very tiny container. And he says, now, I want you to go to other people. And I want you to get their containers. And you are going to now take what you have and you're going to put them into the other people's vessels. And when you do that, Elijah says, your oil is going to increase and you can solve your own problems. So the borrowed vessels, they represent systems, lessons from others. What do borrowed vessels do? They grow and expand your capacity. They grow and expand your capacity. Your oil is little, but it can grow, it can expand if your capacity expands. And not only that, it modifies and shapes what you have. Have you noticed that oil is fluid and whatever vessel you put it in, it takes the shape of the vessel. So the borrowed vessel will shape and modify your oil, what you have. Third, it increases the value of what you have. The vessels did not belong to the widow. They belonged to other people. She was to go around and borrow what others had. So what do you do with your borrowed vessels? You have to seek for them and you have to learn how to use them. Seek for them and learn how to use them. She could not borrow other people's oil. She could only borrow their vessels. Empty vessels. The prophet was very particular. Empty vessels, not with their oil. In borrowing from people, you must be careful not to borrow vessels full of other people's oil. When you borrow empty vessels, you become creative. When you borrow vessels with other people's in it, you become a copycat. You see, it's the way you borrow that will determine whether you become a second class copycat or an original creative. Because every creative idea is a mixture of original concepts and borrowed systems. Every creative idea. And when you check through world development, everything, that's how it is. Original concept and borrowed ideas. Mixture of two different things. 
Do you know that in the Bible, Jesus Christ himself also borrowed vessels? You say, ah, but Jesus had everything. No, he didn't have everything. He borrowed vessels. He said, show me. Yeah, I'll show you. You remember when Jesus wanted to preach to people by the beach? I don't know what Jesus' height was, but I'm sure he was like me, six foot one. You can say he's like you, but uh, I'm sure he was like me, and he looked just my size. <laughs> now, if, you are, if you're on the beach, normally, normally in the beach, as you get to the beach, it gets lower. Is that not so? So if you're talking to people at the beach and you are the lower side, you are down. Jesus wanted an elevated position to talk to the people. And so he sees a fisherman who is preaching and he says to Peter, loan me your ship. It was a borrowed vessel. Jesus had his oil, his anointing, but he took Peter's ship and he added his oil, his own anointing, placed on Peter's ship. He was elevated. He could talk to the people. I'll give you another one. Jesus is, going to, Jesus is going to Jerusalem for his mission. He had his mission. He had his mission. He knew from heaven what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to die. But how to get there was another thing. So he borrowed donkeys. It was not his donkeys. Other people's donkeys. And he used what he had, included it with what other people had, and it took him to his mission. Let me give you another one. Jesus Christ wants to celebrate the last meal, the last supper. We call it communion with his disciples. But he had no space. He knew his mission. But he told them, go and ask that man to give us his upper room. So he had his mission, somebody's upper room. The two together, he was able to accomplish his mission. For you to achieve anything of substance in this world, you are going to need God's creative word, your own original input, your jar of oil, and you're going to need other people's systems and the lessons they have learned. And when you learn to harmonize them well, you can also get out of debt and solve your own problems like that woman. And that's what the woman did. And she went out and borrowed vessels. And I'm sure people were wondering, I, finally, they said, it has affected her. You know, when, when you have so many problems and, and, and you do something radical and people say, finally, it has affected her. The head. Because this is, the widow is now going, can I get your vessel? Can I get your vessel? And she's logoing all the, <laughs> loading all these vessels with her children. And they say, now she's infected her children. <laughs> What is she going to do? Is she going to sell them at Kokompe or what? What is she going to do? But Elisha is teaching her how to solve her problems. The word of God, your oil, other people's vessels. And he says, go and borrow. Remember this. You don't borrow other people's oil. You only borrow the vessels you already have your oil but you must borrow other people's vessels to add value to what you have next week I'm going to talk about how to borrow vessels because borrowing vessels is not like going to like the way we used to uh, do when we were young. Uh, your, your mother is cooking and she has no onion. You say, go and ask uh, Auntie so and so to give me onion. And, and ask this one for pepper. And uh, some people borrow, borrow, borrow and make their own soup with borrow. That's not what I'm talking about. You have to know how to borrow and what to borrow so that you don't borrow something that becomes a disadvantage to you. Because not every vessel is borrowable. And we're going to deal with that next week. But suffice it for now. God 
or the prophet Elisha is encountered with this complicated problem on three dimensions. It's a problem that is financial, it's domestic, it's personal, it's spiritual. It has all these components. It's social. From a woman who in the society she was in was so-called so, uh, so powerless. She's a woman in a man's world. Trying to survive after her man is gone. And Elisha teaches her how to deal with the crisis of her life. I believe you can also deal with the crisis of your life using the same method, the creative word, your jar of oil and borrowed vessels. You can also have an overflow to pay your debts and to live on the rest as a woman had. God bless you. You go to somebody and you ask the person to help you, granting you need money, and you ask the person to give you money, and the person gives you money, in all honesty, do you think it is the best that the person gave you? No. Because the person too has his responsibility. He has his wife, he has his children, so he has to take care of his wife, take care of his children, take care of his rent, take care of his responsibilities, and what is left over is what you get. The question is, do you want the leftover or you want your own money? Do you want to be given fish or you want to be taught how to fish for yourself? This woman says, I don't want your fish. Just teach me how to fish for myself. That is the question she responded to. And what was her answer? She began to respond and she said this. Listen to what she said. She says, I have nothing but. I have nothing but. She had a realization. All of a sudden she realized, yes, my husband is gone. Yes, he didn't leave any money behind. My children are going to go. Then as she was thinking about all that she didn't have, she started constructing a sentence and she said, I have nothing but. Everybody say, I have nothing but. Anytime you introduce a but in a phrase, you are negating the first phrase. So you say, I have nothing, but it means what you're going to say next will negate what you just said. It's like somebody looks at you and says, you know, I like the way you dress and, and oh, you are so handsome and I like your, your, bra, your blouse and, and your, your, is it uh, skirt? Your skirt and, and all of that, but the moment they interject but, to everything they like, it means they're going to tell you something they don't like, which to them is more important than all the things they like. All right? Now, so when, when you're saying, I have nothing, but it means you're going to talk about what you have. That simply means, although you didn't have something, you have now made a realization. She said, I have nothing but. This year, that is the way I want you to talk. When you are complaining about your problems and you say, oh, life is hard and, and things are tough in Ghana, but. And you know, these days, you know, it's difficult to import things and then the Chinese are disturbing our business in Ghana, but. Let me ask you the same, a similar question. Granting you come to me and you are in a situation like this woman and you can't come to my office, you book an appointment with my office and finally you are sitting before Pastor Otebel in his office. And you cry and say, Pastor, listen to me, I have these problems and I owe money and the creditor is coming and I'm being ejected and my children and all this. And you tell me this very, very, very moving tale of woes from your end. Then I ask you two questions. 
what shall I do for you? And what do you have in your house? Which of those questions would you answer? Which one? The first one. That, that's the natural thing. What shall I do for you? Pastor, give me money. Or pray for me. Or talk to somebody for me. Or, or help me, give me some capital. You, 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 I can guarantee you that you will answer the first question. I, I believe even me. I will answer the first question because that is the logical question to ask because you went to the man expecting him to help you. Now he says, what shall I do for you? You would say, give me this. But note, the woman did not answer the first question. She didn't. What shall I do for you? What do you have? She didn't answer the first question. The obvious question was not answered. And that is very important because in life, the questions you choose to respond to will determine the answers you receive. You're going to have a lot of questions, but the questions you choose to respond to will determine the answers you receive. The questions you choose to respond to will determine the quality of answers you receive. Many times when we are in a crisis, we choose to answer the easy questions. And you say, Pastor, what is the easy question? The easy question is the question that requires somebody else to do something for you. That's the easy one. What shall I do for you? Oh, give me money. What shall I do for you? Do this for me. What do you have? We don't respond to that one. But that is the question the woman chose to respond to. Not what shall I do for you, but what do you have in your house? Because when she chose that question, she was saying to Elisha, I don't want you to give me the leftover solutions you have. I want to have a solution that I can sustain in my life. Do you know that if you go borrow vessels, go borrow vessels. I did something like this message some, about 10 years ago, but um, I've reworked it and I think it's appropriate for the season we are in. Go borrow vessels. It is part of the process by which you are going to enter into discovery in this year. And I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Second Kings chapter 4. Second Kings chapter 4. And we're going to read from verses 1 to 7. 2 Kings chapter 4, from verses 1 to 7. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 to 7, are you there? All right, and let's hear the reading of God's word. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant fear the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maid servant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him, shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son bring me another vessel and he said to her there is not another vessel 
so the oil ceased then she came and told the man of God and he said go sell the oil pay your debt you and your sons live on the rest as you can tell the message my sermon title is from the verse 3 go borrow vessels this woman came to the prophet Elisha and she had a dilemma she was in a situation and I believe that at various points in our lives we can identify with this woman because her problems were complex and complicated she had five different kinds of problems first she was suffering personal pain because she was a widow she had just lost her husband we are not told how long it used him and now it seems as if after this man has worked for God for so long God is abandoning the man and the, fa and the family and not only is God abandoning her but she also believes that the church has also abandoned her so she has a spiritual disappointment she is disappointed there's a social stigma she has this domestic situation where her children are going to be taken away she has a financial problem and she's crying as a widow how many problems can one woman carry but there she is and she goes to the only place where she thinks she can receive some help this is her last stop she goes to her husband's boss the man who used to employ the husband, the prophet Elisha. In those days, they had a school of prophets and the prophets worked under Elisha. And so she goes to the boss, who is a man of God, but also the boss of the husband, and says, you have to do something. And she narrates her problems to Elisha. Elisha is a prophet, and normally when you are a prophet or you have spiritual power, when people come to you with a problem, most of the time you dispense solutions. You either say, let me pray for you, or and lay hands on them, or maybe you dip your hand in your pocket and bring out some money and give to them. These were the obvious responses everybody expected from Elisha. Either Elisha puts his hand in his pocket and says, okay, take this. Or Elisha says, let me pray for you. It will be all right. But he didn't pray. And he didn't give her money. Elisha responded in the most unusual way. She responded to the woman's misery with questions. Have you ever been in a situation where you have problems and you want somebody to help you and the person asks you questions? And you're wondering, I mean, listen to me. I'm suffering here and you're asking me questions. If I knew the answer, do you think I'll be standing here? That's what you would say. So Elisha questions the woman. And Elisha asks two questions. Two interesting questions. I want you to note the question. The first one, Elisha says, What shall I do for you? In other words, what do you want me to do for you? What do you think I can do for you? What do you want me to do for you? What are you asking me to do? This question was focused on what the prophet could do the prophet's responsibility what Elisha could do then he asked a second question what do you have in the house this had nothing to do with Elisha it had to do with a woman what shall I do for you what do you have in the house two questions one focus on Elisha's responsibility the other focus on the woman's responsibility. Now let go since her husband died. She probably lost her husband uh, uh, a week before or a month before. But it seems as if it's not too long ago since the husband died. And she is grieving. She is mourning. She is crying because she has suffered a tragedy. The breadwinner of her home is gone. Her lover is gone. Her friend is gone. And she is crying. So she is going through her own personal pain. But one thing you have to realize in life is that when you go through problems, 
problems don't take a leave. Most of the time when problems are coming, they don't come alone. They invite their cousins along. And so whilst you are mourning and you expect people to have sympathy on you, unfortunately, the problems pile up. So she had a second problem. It was a financial crisis. This financial crisis was because she owed money. It seemed as if they owed money when the husband was alive. They couldn't settle the debt, she, the debt they owed until the husband passed away. Now, if you know anything about the world in which this woman lived, in those days, the man was the ultimate breadwinner. He was the one who brought in the money. Now he's dead. The question is, if you couldn't pay your debt when the breadwinner was alive, how can you settle it now that he's gone? So she has a financial crisis. And as if that was not enough, she had a domestic nightmare. What is this domestic nightmare? She's about to lose her children. The creditor is coming to take her children away from her. Can you imagine? She's already lost her husband. She's broke and her children are going to be taken away from her. She's been reduced to nothing in life. So she has this domestic problem and she's thinking, what is going to happen when these two boys are taken away from me? That's all I have. And quite apart from that, she was suffering a social stigma. Shame in the community. If you know anything about debt, when you owe money, you are not the most honorable person alive. You yourself feel bad. And people sometimes speak things about you that make you feel bad. Owing money is not funny. If you've owed money before, you know it's not funny. Even if you come to church and you owe somebody in the church, you, can, you know how you feel. You, you, are, you are going to sit on a row and you see the person you owe on the, on the other extreme of the, of the row. And, and you get there and, and for some reason the Holy Spirit leads you to another row. You know, you, you, you see people and you dodge, you hide because you can't stand them. And, and it's a stigma, it's a social stigma, it's a sense of inferiority. Fifth, she had spiritual disappointment and that was the most difficult problem she had because she was frustrated with God because her husband served God for so long. The husband was a prophet, worked under Elisha. God 